So the talk today is really to discuss the effects of long-term ART on the HIV reservoir, and this will really hopefully just give everybody a nice broad overview of where science currently is, where the paradigm currently is in terms of how we see HIV persisting in people on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, or ART, and how ART changes the composition of the HIV reservoir over time in people. So in the talk, I'll be discussing how HIV can and establish a chronic infection of T cells and establish what we call a reservoir, with some of these viruses being more active than others. I'll also discuss how we find that on ART, active HIV infected cells are cleared faster than inactive cells. And this means that the HIV reservoir becomes less active over time on ART. And hopefully, as I mentioned, this should provide everybody with a nice framework and a nice uh, ground foundational understanding of how a less active reservoir affects how well cure strategies may work depending on their approach, whether a cure strategy tries to make a cell more active over time and therefore more easily cleared by the immune system, or whether a cure strategy tries to keep the cell latent, keep it inactive over time, and therefore less likely to rebound during uh, when individuals stop therapy. And ultimately, this, will, this may dictate to us that differences in the composition of the HIV reservoir may require tailoring of cure interventions depending on where somebody is along their treatment journey. So before I discuss the HIV biology, which is very unique and very interesting, it's important for us to go back to the foundations of biology. And by this, I'm talking about the central dogma of biology, which really dictates how cells are able to produce everything that they and therefore our bodies need to function. So the central dogma of biology states that we start off with a genetic code to produce all of these things. And this genetic code is called deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Let me just change to a laser pointer. So this is the DNA molecule here, our genetic code that's inside this nucleus in our, in our cells. And this DNA molecule gets converted into a messenger molecule that we call ribonucleic acid or RNA. And this messenger molecule, this RNA, can then leave the nucleus and be converted into protein. And this protein is really what provides all of the function of our cells. So if we think about the cells in our hair follicles, maybe the protein is keratin to actually produce the, the hair on our heads. Or if it's our skin cells, maybe this protein is, is melanin to give us pigment in our skin. Or if we're thinking about CD4 T cells, which are the host cell for HIV, maybe these proteins are all of the different chemicals and the chemokines and cytokines that are needed to fight off infection so our immune system can do its job. So really we can think about this, this pipeline almost like a cookbook where DNA is our, our cookbook. It has a set of all of the recipes that we might need to produce a meal, but I don't know about everybody else, when I'm cooking, I make a big mess and I take up a lot of space. So I don't really want my cookbook in the kitchen because it, it takes up even more space that I don't want it to do. And I don't necessarily want it to get schmutzy with all of the food that I'm making in the kitchen. So instead of bringing the cookbook with me into the kitchen to make my meal, I'm going to just copy the recipe that I want, that I'm interested in. And that, that copy of that recipe is what we say is RNA. And now that I've got this copy of this recipe, which is almost identical to what's actually in the cookbook, I can take that, that RNA copy, that recipe copy, and I can take it into the kitchen and start actually making my proteins that I'm interested in, start making my meal, which in this case is Martha Stewart's delicious chop chop cookies. And because we as scientists like to have really confusing terminology for people to remember, we say that uh, when we're converting DNA into RNA, this is transcription, or the DNA is transcribed into RNA. And you can kind of think of this as being in the same language as each other. We're going from words to words. So we're just transcribing the recipe from a book in, onto another piece of paper. Then when we're going from RNA into protein, we're changing languages. We're going from words into actual food, right? So now we say that RNA is translated into protein, or the, the process of making protein from RNA is called translation. So what makes HIV so unique and what makes it such a retrovirus is the fact that um, HIV, when it binds to the CD4 T cell that you can see here, and I recognize that this is a very busy slide, but you don't need to pay attention to everything here. Really just focus on what's going on in the nucleus. 
And you can see that when HIV binds to that CD4 receptor on our T cell and is able to, to bind to the cell and release its cargo, this HIV genome, which is, which is actually in the form of RNA, enters the nucleus, and then it has to undergo what we call reverse transcription. So the RNA is converted back into DNA. And then what HIV can do from here is that now that it's made this new DNA molecule, it can integrate this DNA molecule into our host cell's DNA, into its own genome. And from here, the cell is basically just reading a recipe. It, it, we're now working in a language that the cell understands because we're going from DNA into RNA to make those messenger molecules, which then leave the nucleus and get converted into proteins to make all of the different ingredients that we need for our meal, or in this case, it's HIV. And this process of going from RNA into DNA back into RNA is uh, really going against that central dogma that I mentioned earlier, that central dogma of biology. And because it's going against that dogma, we say it's retro, it's going against it, it's a retrovirus. And what's important to remember is that all currently licensed antiretroviral therapy drugs, except for the newly licensed lenacapitlia, which is a capsid inhibitor, they all act pre-integration. And so what this means is that ART is very effective at preventing a cell from becoming infected, but once a cell is already infected and has that HIV genome integrated into its genome, then that cell is going to remain infected for as long as that cell survives. And another point of terminology, we call this HIV genome that's been integrated a provirus. And so what we can really think about is um, similar to uh, an episode of Friends. I don't know how many people have watched Friends before, but there's this episode on Thanksgiving where Rachel is trying to prove herself as a competent chef in the kitchen and prove that she can make a delicious Thanksgiving meal. So she wants to make a Thanksgiving trifle. And so she starts to read the recipe and she starts to make all of the different layers of, of this trifle. And she puts in the biscuits and the cream and the berries and the jam, and it, it's all looking delicious. But then suddenly... Uh, the two pages of the recipe book get stuck together. And when she flips that page over, she starts reading a recipe for a uh, shepherd's pie. And so she starts putting minced meat and peas into this Thanksgiving trifle and then flips back and starts putting back more cream and more biscuits and jam and everything. And this is really what HIV is doing. It's getting its own recipe and it's inserting that recipe into our recipe book. And the cell doesn't realize that there's any difference between these two recipes. The cell just sees a recipe and starts reading it off and starts making whatever that recipe is in the same way that Rachel is just making the recipes in front of her to make this Thanksgiving trifle. And she doesn't realize that she's making something wrong. She doesn't realize she's making shepherd's pie or maybe HIV in this instance until people external like Ross and Joey say that this tastes terrible. And when we think about DNA and we think about the human genome, we, we think about these really tiny complex things, right? We've got these microscopic cells and within those, we've got even smaller pieces of molecules like DNA, but DNA in the human genome is actually really big. If we were able to get the DNA from just a single cell and, and stretch it out, it would expand to almost two meters or six feet long. And if we talk about DNA as, as being this cookbook, it's got its own language. And instead of having an alphabet of 26 letters, it's got an alphabet of four letters, A, C, T, and G. So the human genome is 3.1 billion base pairs or 3.1 billion letters long. In comparison, the, th the King James Bible is 3.1 million letters long. And then if we look at HIV, it's much, much tinier. It's only 9,800 base pairs long. So this means that HIV is inserting this tiny little recipe into a recipe book that is a thousand times longer than the Bible is. What's really interesting as well is that if we investigate our own human genome, we can actually find that about 10% of the human genome is what we call endogenized retroviruses. These are really ancient retroviruses, so related to HIV, but they've been integrated into our D DNA for so long that they've, they've become inactive. They can't actually produce any virus, but we've archived their DNA in our own. And this really indicates to us that we've been coexisting with retroviruses for a very long period of time. And so not only is the human genome comprised of a lot of DNA that is in our own, but there's a lot of redundancy in our human genome. 
so much so that only about 1% of the human genome actually encodes for proteins, actually has those re recipes for the cells to make things. And we call these protein coding regions genes. And so because DNA is this really big, long piece of molecule and we need to shove it inside a tiny microscopic cell, this DNA has to be highly organized. And you can see that here with this green string of, um, this, this green string here wrapping around a bunch of molecules. And that green string is DNA and it's wrapping around molecules called histones. Again, the name's not important, but you might hear histones being mentioned a lot later. And these molecules, once DNA is wrapped around them, they undergo a lot more wrapping around and even further tighter organization to create chromatin, which then undergoes even more supercoiling to create chromosomes that are present in our nucleus. And you can see that there's a really, really big jumble of DNA in this nucleus. But in order for us to actually read the genes, that DNA needs to be relaxed and needs to be opened back up into this open state for us to read it. The same way that we can't just look at a, a closed cookbook and know what to cook. We need to open that, that book up to the right page in order for us to read that recipe and make whatever we need to make. And we find that this process of opening up that DNA tends to happen on the outskirts or on the, the periphery of this nucleus. And so what this means is that we tend to find that HIV integrates its genome into actively transcribed genes. And this isn't always the case, and there are very notable exceptions that I'll talk about later. But this kind of makes sense, right? If a virus is trying to slot its recipe into our recipe book, it's much easier to do that when the recipe's book is open to a specific page with the recipe on it. And if we think about this virus coming in from an external place into the nucleus, it's not going to want to try and weed through all of this jungle of DNA. It just wants to get in as fast as possible. So it tends to integrate into parts of the DNA around the periphery of this nucleus. And so this means that the site of HIV integration can really impact where the, the virus activity of infected cells afterwards. If the virus is able to integrate into a gene that's very commonly read, maybe it's a, a recipe for spaghetti bolognese, for instance, where you're going to read it every week, that virus is going to be made quite a lot. And then there can be other parts of the, the human genome where there's no genes, right? It's the same way that a, a cookbook has a lot of photos in it, or it maybe has a spiel at the beginning of why the author wanted to make the cookbook, or the index at the end. And they're all important for the context of the cookbook, but they're not actually necessary for us to make anything from it. And this means that we're not going to be reading those regions as often. So if a virus is able to integrate into those parts of the DNA, it's not going to be read as much and it's not going to be as active. And so what this means is that we really create kind of two states of infection with HIV. There's the productive infection that we often think about with viruses, where we have our HIV DNA here integrated into our own human genome, but that HIV DNA is being read. It's making those messenger RNA molecules, and those messenger RNA molecules are being translated into actual virus, and that virus is being released from that cell. And maybe this is a cell that has that integration site in one of those really active, highly transcribed genes. But we can also have a state of latent infection. And this is a cell that still has an HIV DNA genome inside of its own DNA, but that gene isn't that DNA isn't being read. It's not making any of those messenger molecules. It's not making any virus. And this might be a cell that has an integration site in one of those less commonly read parts of the human genome. But importantly, we do need productive infection for the clearance of infected cells. We actually need the, the, the cell to be making the recipes of that virus in order for us to realize that there's something wrong with it. If a cell remains latent, the immune system doesn't recognize that there's anything wrong with it. The same way that we can't look at a closed book and realize that there's an issue or a typo or an error in that book. We actually have to open it up and start doing things with it in order for us to realize that. And so ultimately, we do need that HIV expression to, to result in the clearance of infected cells. So then the question is then, what happens to people who are on long-term ART? And we've been really beneficial that over the last two, two decades and even longer when antiretroviral therapy has been uh, invented and being been uh, circulated amongst people, particularly when it's highly active and if effective, it means that we can really study what the virus is doing without having new cells from being infected. And we can really see in individuals who are very um, 
who are very motivated and who are very uh, devoted to our understanding of the biology of what their bodies are, we can see how the reservoir changes over time on therapy. And so there's a few different things that can happen once we start antiretroviral therapy. So if we look here at the beginning here, we've got some cells that are already productively infected. They're already producing virus and they're probably gonna die off pretty quickly once someone starts therapy. We might have some other cells here that you can see that they're, they're latent to begin with, but eventually they're going, to, they're going to activate and produce virus and die off. But you can see that we've got other cells that are able to remain latent for the entire time that we're on therapy. And you can see these are persisting all the way through. So we can say that we've got some cells that are productively infected and ultimately they'll be eliminated from the body. We have some cells that are shallow latent. So they're, they're, latent, they're latent to begin with, but then they activate and they become productive and then they're going to be eliminated as well. But it's really these cells here that are able to remain deeply latent for the entire time and persist for the entire time on ART that uh, we need to look at and we need to try and eliminate in order to achieve a cure for HIV. So we can say that over time, the reservoir becomes more latent, right? At the beginning, we start with a few cells that are already active, a few cells that will become active at some point, and just one cell that's really not active, it's very deeply latent. But by the end, all the cells that remain are those ones that are deeply latent. And you can also see there's an, another process that's occurring here where this one cell is dividing into multiple cells. And again, this makes sense if we think about the fact that HIV infects our immune cells, our CD4 positive T cells. So these cells, we want to be responding to things. If I get a cold, I want to have T cells in my lungs and in my throat and in my nose responding to the virus there. Maybe I even want T cells all the way in my blood just to make sure that the cold virus doesn't get all the way there. But what this means is that if my T cells are responding to things in the environment as they should be, but they're infected, every time that that cell divides, the virus also divides. And maybe one of these infected cells for some reason also activates and dies off, but these other ones are able to persist. And we can also find that maybe one of these cells again undergoes more division events. Maybe I get sick again a year later, or maybe I get a vaccination at some point in my life and uh, the cells divide that way. And so we can say that these cells that have arisen, they're clones of each other. They've arise from this one cell here and they're, they're identical to each other. So they're clones. So we find that not only does the HIV reservoir become more latent over time, but it also becomes more clonal over time. And you'll probably hear quite a few presentations at the conference this year on these two concepts, on HIV clonality and HIV latency as well. So in summary, AOT is highly effective at preventing cells from becoming infected with HIV, but it's ineffective against cells already infected with HIV. And HIV uses a unique biology to integrate its, its genome into the host cell's DNA, and therefore is able to persist for as long as that infected cell survives. And as uh, Richard mentioned earlier, these, these cells are very long lived as well. HIV, is in, HIV integration is somewhat random, but there are preferences for actively transcribed genes. And again, there are exceptions where HIV can integrate into those more silent parts of the DNA. And importantly for infected cells to actually be cleared by the immune system, we need viral expression. And HIV can establish a latent state of infection where it actually is able to remain inactive and therefore is hidden from the immune system and will keep persisting. We find that proviruses that are more latent are able to be hidden and survive longer in people with HIV. And this means that the HIV reservoir becomes more latent over time on ART. And though the reservoir decreases on ART, this is counteracted by those division events of infected cells by clonal expansion, those cells undergoing division, responding to whatever they're responding to the, in the environment. And here we say that the HIV reservoir becomes more clonal over time on ART. So this means that there's quite a few outstand, excuse me, outstanding research questions in the field. And you'll probably, again, see quite a few presentations trying to address some of these questions. Firstly, what determines if a cell will be latent or productively infected? We know some of these factors and we know integration site is important, but it isn't everything. There are other factors that are contributing to whether a cell will be latent or productive. Furthermore, we don't really know if, what determines if a cell will switch from a latent state to a productive state, or can a cell switch from a productive state back to a latent state and therefore be hidden again? And 
can we be certain that a cell that is latent now will always be latent later? Or at some point in the future, is it just going to randomly reactivate? We also want to understand what makes one cell undergo clonal expansion and not another and contribute to a, a disproportionate representation of these clones of infected cells at one time point compared to another time point. Some people also want, un want to understand whether the virus itself can make infected cells divide and survive better and therefore make the, the reservoir even more long lived. And importantly, there's a lot of discussion about what a cure should be trying to achieve. Should a cure be trying to make HIV less latent and therefore less hidden from the immune system and more easily cleared? Or should we be trying to make the HIV reservoir more latent and therefore more hidden, but less likely of reactivating once somebody stops therapy? And I think uh, what a lot of people are thinking about as well is that is long ART enough to actually enrich for a deeply latent reservoir that doesn't rebound when, when therapy is stopped? So hopefully this really provides a nice framework for people to understand what us as researchers and us as clinicians are thinking about when we're uh, asking research questions, when we're conducting clinical trials. But you can see that this is um, a really ever-growing field and a lot of this research has only emerged in the past few years with um, some really amazing techniques to be able to discriminate between all of these different cells rather than just thinking that one infected cell is identical to another infected cell. We really have learned that the quality and the composition of these cells matters. Thank you. So Jared, we had a lot of questions online. Um, Great. I wanted to start with some of them. So someone wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on T regulatory cells being a reservoir, given that they would be more resistant to death by uh, propitosis or apoptosis? Yeah, so um, not only is it the virus that kind of, and its integration site that might dictate where, um, whether a cell survives or not, but it's also that the, the cell type that matters. So T regulatory cells, they're even more long lived and they might even be more quiescent. We have memory cells, which are cells that we want in our body, but they're not really responding to anything yet. And these are also going to be less active than cells that are responding straight away. So it's not just the virus that's important, but it's the cells. And even where the cells are located as well, we can have cells that are present in our blood and we can have cells that are present in our lymph node. And they're really important for us to understand and they can have differences as well. And it's, it's something that researchers think a lot about. Like we can get a ton of blood from people, but it may not be telling us what's happening in someone's lymph node. It may not be telling us what's happening in someone's tissues. And those are definitely important sites to be looking at as well. Great. Another question was, which antiretrovirals create a state of deeper latency or is there uh, no difference in which drugs are used? Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with any research demonstrating that there's differences in uh, different drugs. There have been some studies conducted where you intensify some regimens such as um, dolutegravir to see if you can try and reduce the reservoir even more. But we generally find that this doesn't work. And I think this is because, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, these antiretrovirals are acting pre-integration. There's actually nothing stopping, none of these medications are stopping the virus from waking up and producing any more virus. So I think this is a really good indication and a really good confirmation that our immune systems do a lot to keep this virus under control. Because even though we've got antiretroviral therapy preventing new cells from being infected, it's not stopping anything from these cells from producing more virus. So the fact that we have undetectable viral loads means that our immune system is doing a lot in combination with the, the treatments as well. And another question is, is there good research on which antiretrovirals can pass the blood brain barrier and work on infected cells there in the brain? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that are doing research on that and trying to understand um, if certain tissues, particularly the brain, can act as what we call sanctuary sites, where there isn't enough antiretroviral medication in those tissues, and maybe we get some ongoing replication. Um, and there are different drugs that have been shown to have different distributions, but ultimately, um, whilst the field is still a bit divided, I would say that the consensus is that we don't really see ongoing replication, which is hopefully a good confirmation for us that antiretroviral medications are still very effective in those sites. And those are all the questions that were online. I don't know if questions in the room. 
think this is such an important topic, you know, we, we study the early HIV infection, where the test of people twice a few times a week to pick up early infection, and that's where a lot of re your research focuses on low density scale. There are many, many people living longer now with spread viral loads for decades. And I really appreciate you focusing on that population. Are there any ongoing intervention trials focused on her efforts in the population? In populations of people who have been on chronically suppressed for decades. Yeah, I would actually say that most of the research is being done in those populations. These, we're really thankful and really grateful for long-term survivors who've been on therapy for a very long time. One, for being able to be on therapy for a very long time. There's obviously a burden to having to take medication every single day. Um, but these people are, are very altruistic and, and very generous with their time. And I would say that there's there's really great representation of these, yeah. these individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I agree, I think, an outstanding research question is to understand are there differences in, in the reservoir in somebody who's able to start therapy within the first couple of weeks of acquiring HIV? Does their reservoir differ to somebody who's had HIV for a while and it hasn't been treated either because they there weren't any medications around or they didn't have access to it or they weren't diagnosed yet? Um, and I think there are some studies looking at that for sure. And it's it's important. And again, may indicate that we need to tailor our curative interventions to those different populations. Will one curative intervention work for somebody who's been, who acquired HIV very early and, and was on treatment very early and may therefore have a very small reservoir, but it hasn't undergone all of those immune selection events that I talked about that somebody who had a more progressive HIV acquisition uh, may have. I kind of wanted to ask a question about that very last bit because it's sort of interesting and intriguing and the nature of the way it sounds like a very dangerous part. But it's probably impossible to answer. Do you think it's possible that some of the people might reach at this point after 20 decades of treatment where the only virus that's left is not the and you can't actually do that? Yeah, I think it's a really new, um, a really new question for us to address. And there's there's some research in the research in the literature suggesting that, and certainly we have evidence from elite controllers and exceptionally elite controllers who are able to really maintain entirely undetectable viral loads without ART. And these individuals do tend to have integration sites in those more quiescent, those more silent parts of the DNA. But these studies are, are still very limited by small sample numbers. So I think we need to, if we do want to go down this approach, we need to go through more expansive clinical studies to really assess this. And again, it's, it's very difficult because how long, how long do you observe somebody for? If, and that idea of if you haven't shown that there's any reactivation for five years, how do you know that that's not going to happen for 10 or 20 years? Because we still don't know all of the factors that contribute to a virus reactivating. It still does seem quite stochastic and, and quite random. So Maybe somebody's able to go for 20, 25, 30 years, but that one virus that's able to reactivate in one really niche part of the human body that we haven't looked at can seed rebound very quickly, as we've seen with analytical treatment interruptions, where individuals who are treated for a very long time still rebound within a few weeks of stopping therapy. I think um, the last question before when you just answered it really interesting, especially as we think about populations who test later in our diagnostic, you know, something about like the brown people want to be sad. Do we have any thoughts on, you know, what that would look like for those key populations um, that are just, you know, routinely underreached, under resourced? And um, just like under, um, um, not just not including. Yeah, I think it's definitely a gap in the current research field, and certainly those populations are under researched. So, again, it's difficult for us to extrapolate the, the evidence that we have in our limited sample of predominantly cis gay white men and say, is this going to be the case in people of color? Is this going to be the case in cisgender women or transgender women? Um, is this going to be the case for people of all ages as well? I, I think we do really need to expand on these things because they may, hopefully they, they are 
extrapolatable, but it may not be possible. Um, and certainly I think also um, an outstanding research question as we start to think about interventions in the context of ongoing viremia, whether that's somebody who's receiving an intervention before they start antiretroviral therapy, or maybe they uh, stop antiretroviral yeah. therapy and then receive a, an intervention is what happens <clears> if <throat> they've been diagnosed quite late and have a low CD4 count where there's generally an exclusion criteria for those individuals and we're really then not able to understand what that what's going on in those bodies. And as you mentioned, that means that we're going to be excluding even more people of color, even more women across the world as well, which isn't what we want. Um, so, completely um, uh, forget about people in HIV and everybody else, right? Um, we know that the immune system <clears throat> wanes as people get older and older and older, um, and it's sort of part of senescence and all that. So, that infected in some of the cure trials, things where older people are not included in the trial for some pretty good scientific reasons. Then on top of that, you have people with HIV who <clears throat> either chronic inflammation or whatever are prematurely aging. So they're experiencing all that a little bit earlier, which I assume, I would assume also affects the immune system. So what are your thoughts or just reflections on that whole era, the whole subject of the immune system wanes and the big cure research and we've got the reservoir all the rest of them? Yeah, it, it can really kind of go either way in the sense of in a waning immune system might mean that we aren't able to have as long of viral suppression without therapy because that immune system just isn't able to keep up and keep control of it. But it might also be beneficial in the sense of as your immune system wanes, those, those cells that are undergoing that clonal expansion are also going to decrease, right? Because your, your immune system is hopefully by that point already developed. It's already responded to all of the pathogens that you should be responding to. So maybe we actually see a decrease in the persistence of, of cells in, in older people. But I think um, it's still something to, to look at. And certainly immune exhaustion is important as well. Um, and in the context of, for instance, immune checkpoint blockade, what happens if you actually remove that immune exhaustion? Do you get increased proliferation of cells or not? Do you get increased activation of cells or not? That's definitely something that's being researched um, both in the lab as well as in clinical trials. Great. Um, before you go, Jared, I just wanted to read this for you. Um, this was one of the best presentations I've heard since joining a cab. You have made a difficult scientific issue very easy to understand as a non-scientific person. Okay. Your real world example has helped make everything make sense. And I wanted to let you know that directly. So that was from one of the people there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really care about trying to make this very difficult science to be easily understandable for people. So I'm more than happy to share these slides with, with wider demographics for sure. I'm not gonna run to you tonight. I'm just gonna make my way to the city of light.